Hello everyone, welcome to Duke Williams online uh, learning platform for uh, financial reporting, FR. Uh, in this session and subsequent sessions, we'll be looking at uh, accounting for non-current assets. Accounting for uh, non-current assets. Now, in terms of overview, uh, we'll be looking at uh, property, plant and equipment, which is IA16. We'll look at uh, borrowing costs, which is IS23. We'll look at investment property, IS40, government grant, IS20, uh, non-current asset health sale and discontinued operation, IFRS5. We'll look at intangible assets. We'll look at agriculture and fair value measurement. So uh, to start with right away, we we'll look at uh, PPE, property, plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment. Now, uh, let's see the breakdowns of this one. Now, for property, plant, and equipment, uh, example, if you say property, uh, you mean land and building. Land and building. Now, if you say a plant, a plant could mean uh, machines for production. So, we have machines. Plant could mean uh, generators. Uh, again, plant could mean uh, we have a motor vehicle. Equipment, you could mean uh, computers, office computers, uh, desktop, laptops, uh, accessories. Uh, equipment could also mean uh, other uh, fixtures and fittings. You could have uh, fixtures and fittings. Now, all these are examples of uh, property, plant, and equipment. Uh, so let's take note. Now, let's get down to the details of property, plant, and equipment under IA 16. Now, what do you mean by property, plant, and equipment? You see, for all the examples of the assets I have listed above, the objective for buying or purchasing these assets are for use in the ordinary course of business. They are for use in the ordinary course of business. They are not held for sale. And they are not held for uh, their capital appreciation. They are not held for rentals. So what it means is that if these assets are held for use in the production of goods or rendering of services in the ordinary course of business, then they are PPE then they are pp so the objective for acquiring these assets they are not held for sale they are not held for their resale if they are held for their resale we'll look at inventory inventory or for their capital appreciation uh, we could have a land a land and building which could be acquired for their capital appreciation so that subsequently then the entity will sell it now if this is the objective then the entity would have to account for these asset using uh, is 40 which you call investment property so uh, and then the inventory will be looking at is2 now the clear distinction here is that the ppe these are asset acquired for use acquired for use in the ordinary course of business acquired for use in the ordinary course of business and that is pp mm. we look at recognition recognition uh it has not changed uh from the new recognition criteria in the conceptual framework so uh, the first recognition criteria is that it should meet the definition of an asset it should meet the definition of an asset and basically we look at control we look at control now, what does control mean? Uh, control means that the entity should be able to direct the user. So, the entity should be able to direct the user. Direct the user of the asset. So, the entity decides what happens to the asset. The entity decides how the asset is used. That is control. And control does not indicate ownership. It is not necessary that... Uh, the entity need to own the asset before they can recognize it. So what it means here is that uh, 
once the entity enjoys or obtains substantially so obtain substantially so substantially all the economic benefits from use from use of asset and this indicate control what does it mean it means that as the entity is using the asset all the economic benefit from the use of the asset should come to the entity it should not go to any other party so substantially all the economic benefits should come to what the entity so that is control now the second criteria is that it should be probable that future economic benefit will flow to the entity future economic benefit will flow to the entity and we can reliably what measure we can reliably measure now let's see that as an institution duke williams we own a building we own a building and this building uh, is used for uh, our classes our tuition so uh, what it means is that if this was acquired uh, let's say at a cost of uh, let's say two million dollars if it was acquired at a cost of two million dollars and we expect that it will last for the next 50 years and the intention for buying this building is for uh, use uh, to provide tuition now in terms of recognition we have to ask ourselves now do we control it is it meeting the definition yes uh, it is a resource arising from what so this is an economic resource controlled by DW and often we say from past what event we would have we have bought it or we have we have put it up so it is meeting the definition so the definition is met so the definition of asset the next thing is Will there be economic benefit? Yes, there will be economic benefit because we are using it. So, uh, economic benefit in the form of fees or uh, sale uh, of tuition. Okay, as we sell tuition or we collect fees that's the economic benefits the economic benefit that would derive from it now do we know how much yes we know the cost and the cost here the cost here is two million so the two million is the cost so if you put all these together we, we, we are going to recognize the burden because it means the definition we control it we know uh, that we use it for tuition but nothing else uh, we decide how uh, the, the building will be used uh, and we derive economic benefit from it and we know the cost or if it is not the cost then we can determine what the fair value and, and fair value often when it is a leased asset when it is a leased asset initial recognition initial recognition uh what we say is that initial measurement we measure at cost we measure at cost and cost means that uh, purchase price purchase price and if it is an imported asset if it is an imported asset we add uh, import tax we add import tax and this import tax should be non refundable should be non refundable now discounts which are allowed will be deducted from the purchase price because it has not been incurred or uh, discount and allowances like rebates will be used to reduce the purchase price then we add all directly attributable costs all directly attributable costs we say that they are necessary they are necessary costs 
incurred to put the asset in a condition for use. All these costs are necessary to put the asset in a condition for use. And we say that they are directly attributable cost. They are directly attributable cost. Now, examples of directly attributable cost, we have site operation, uh, employee benefit cost, uh, this pension or wages and salary cost. We have carriage cost, we have professional fees, testing cost, and then uh, if we have future unavoidable cost, uh, like site restoration provision, or like decommissioning or dismantling cost. All these are necessary what? costs. Okay, now let's try to give ourselves an example. So, example of initial measurement. Let's say we have imported plant and equipment. We have an imported plant and equipment to use. Now, this has been imported uh, maybe from the US. From the US. And maybe uh, it cost $100,000. It cost $100,000. And this is how much we have placed with the supplier so cost or purchase price now the question is do we have any other cost yes because we are importing it we would have to incur import levy maybe the import levy is around uh, let's say two thousand dollars now point number one without the import we cannot get access to the plant so it is a directly attributable cost directly attributable cost we need to know that now the next example is that do we have to move it after we have cleared it yes so carriage carriage cost uh, let's say carriage cost is around five hundred dollars now if we have to carry it uh, carry it basically uh, is the cost of transporting so transportation so this is also another directly attributable cost so directly attributable without which the machine cannot be uh, at the port for us to use we need to transport it so maybe we need another vehicle to carry it from the port to our own premises now maybe before the machine came we prepared a place so we have a site preparation cost site preparation so we have put up a small uh, room or house uh, a shed sort of to, to house it so that it is not exposed to the weather and let's say we put up this one at a cost of three thousand dollars again it's an example of uh, a direct cost a directly attributable cost now what other cost can we incur now we need uh, an expert to come and uh, assemble the, uh, the the machine for us, the equipment. So we have no expertise. So we can say uh, professional fees. So maybe professional fees, uh, expert to uh, let's say uh, assemble the plan 
again this falls under directly attributable cost it's a direct cost it's a direct cost it's a direct cost and let's say we have spent around uh, let's say again two thousand dollars now for us to see whether the machine uh, is okay we need to test so there'll be testing costs and this testing cost could be uh, maybe uh, fuel or lubricants or maybe we need some uh, bolts and nuts etc and let's say that this cost us around uh, another three hundred dollars and lastly because we would want this expert to be servicing uh, the machine and also get to train our staff we have training costs uh, for staff on how to use the machine so let's say we have about uh, another thousand and closely linked to this uh, is what I was saying that we have uh, a maintenance service and maintenance maintenance service and maintenance contract with the expert contract with expert to be servicing this plan for us to be servicing this plan for us and this will last over two years and the contract we, sp we, we have paid for the contract worth around let's say five thousand dollars a lot of cost here yes details of cost here clearly we need to be able to know which ones have to fall within the recognition the initial recognition criteria and which ones would not be recognized now to start with of course we've bought the machine so uh, this we say capitalize so it means that we we'll recognize it we we'll re we'll recognize the first one number one import we, 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 we cap we capitalize it number two carried cost is necessary so we capitalize number three site preparation necessary so we cap number four professional uh, fees so we cap number five testing yes to see how it functions number six now number six uh, number seven because it is not a necessary cost uh, these are cost uh, it is not cost to put the asset in a condition for use it is only to train our staff on how to use the asset so therefore it is not a directly attributable cost so this should be expensed and this will go to PNL so the training cost for staff will be expensed so the thousand will go to PNL now the contract we sign with the expert the maintenance cost uh, contract cost with the expert for two years would also go to PNL because it's not a necessary cost so number eight would be expensed all of this will go to PNL so uh, on a basis of this we have a clear understanding of which costs are necessary and which costs are not what necessary for the asset to be put into a condition for use I hope this makes sense for the initial uh, measurement now uh, for the future restoration costs it, it could be a mining equipment that we have bought and we have to install this mining equipment to be able to add mine maybe after the end of the mining license or concession period we would need to dismantle so this becomes an obligation for us from the word go at the point that we sign a contract or the point that we have obtained a license maybe from the local authority or from the national uh, uh, 
uh, authority. So, if we have acknowledged this obligation, it becomes part of the directly attributable cost at the initial measurement. So, the cost we incur in the future, even though maybe it might be two, uh, ten years away from now, we should be able to what find the present value. We should be able to discount it at the entity's cost of capital so that we find the cost and add it and add it to all the other directly attributable costs okay now uh, finance cost which is another uh, example of initial measurement initial measurement cost finance cost now finance cost what it means is that the entity have borrowed or have taken a loan in terms of, I just want to uh, make it simple for you to understand. The entity has taken a loan, maybe a loan of 10 million at the rate of 10% uh, to construct. To construct. The key word here is construct. We'll look at it under the standard borrowing cost. To construct an asset. Now, the interest, the interest, the interest which is a 10 percent the entity is allowed so the entity is allowed to add the interest cost to the 10 million in cat on the asset and this becomes another attributable cost so as per the IS23, which we'll be looking at later, the entity can add the interest cost and we call it borrowing cost. So that's another example of what uh, a direct cost to be incurred at the initial measurement. Good. Let's look at an example. Uh, yes. ABC acquires a mining concession, a mining concession at xyz state for a total cost of 100 million abc is required to dismantle so uh, like we were looking at earlier this is a future unavoidable cost without which abc will not be allowed to mine and so dismantle all equipment and carry out a landscaping of the area the estimated cost was 30 million after 10 years abc's cost of capital is 10 percent is 10 percent now required show the initial measurement uh, cost and double what entry for the acquisition of the mine now let's see the initial measurement is that the cost one so initial measurement We need the cost of the mine. So, cost of the mine, which we have seen to be 100 million. That's the concession that they have acquired. That's 100 million. Now, we would have to add. So, point two, we add the future unavoidable because it's an obligation unavoidable cost which is the dismantling and the landscaping of the area now because this is uh, several years away from now which is ten, uh, 10 years away from now we need to discount the 30 million at 10 percent for 10 years so this would give us present value of this future amount is equal to 30 million times uh, and often in the exam we could be given the discount factor but when we are not given we can find the discount factor this way 1 over 1.1 so it's 100 plus 10 percent 1.1 is 100 plus 10 percent and the 10 percent is the, the the rate of interest which is the cost of capital raised to power 10 raised to power 10 and let's see how much this will give us so 1 1.1 raised to power 10 1 divided by the answer so uh, this will give us a discount factor so the whole of this 
this give us a discount factor of 0 0.3 to four decimal places 3855 so this 0 0.3855 times 30 would give us 11.57 to two decimal places million so the present value of this amount which is 10 years away from now have been determined as 11.57 and what it means is that uh, this amount this amount 11 this amount 11.57 would have to be compounded at a rate of 10 percent every year to grow so that in 10 years time would have 30 million and by that growth we call it unwinding it is unwinding interest which would compound the amount so the amount to be compounded at a rate of 10 percent so that in 10 years time we can get 30 million but that will be subsequent measurement so at this point we are looking at initial measurement so the total cost the total cost the total cost the total cost would be so total cost total cost of mine would be equal to 100 plus 11.57 and that will give us 111.57 million so that's the total cost that's the total cost good now uh, in terms of finding the uh, the double entry uh, finding a double entry here we, we need to be able to know uh, uh, the debit and credit debit and credit debit and credit so what we do is that uh, uh, let me uh, sort of uh, summarize uh, this for you as a recap as a recap So as a recap for you in terms of double entry and uh, I'll need you to pay attention because we'll have to apply double entry almost throughout all our lessons. So what I'll do is that I'll divide this into two parts. I'll have assets here. I'll have liability. Uh, I'll have uh, equity of equity good so this is into two now in terms of our double entry let's look at for asset we say that point number one to increase whenever an asset value increase so to increase an asset we make a debit we make debit entry we make a debit entry to increase an asset we make a debit entry so this is debit again what it means is that to to decrease that is a reduction to decrease an asset We make credit credit we make credit entry and that is credit so if asset value goes down we credit if value goes up we debit now closely linked to how we account for asset as expenses the same principle for uh, assets so if we are to increase so increase means that if we incur an expense so to increase an expense or to recognize an expense we make debit entry we make debit entry so debit 
So the opposite is that to decrease an expense we make credit entry so if an expense reduces we credit we credit now let's come to uh, liability equity and let me just add that we have income in this category so uh, to simplify it because we have the understanding now to increase liability equity and income we make credit entry the opposite credit entry and then to to decrease liability again equity and income we make debit we make debit entry we make debit entry we make debit entry so uh, this as the plus and minuses that will be happening in our books so uh, let's take note of them the plus and minuses so uh, at your request uh, i can make this available to you later so let's see how we can apply this uh, let's see how we can apply this to our debit and credit which is the double entry now at this point the double entry, the double entry, the double entry to record would be because we are we are spending money, we have to debit assets, which is the mine. So we debit the mine with the total cost 111.57 million. And let's see how well the credit would arrange. Now the first credit is that because we are paying we pay bank or cash now it is the initial amount of 100 million which we have paid to acquire the concession now you will see that there is a difference of 11.57 to balance of this uh, entry and to balance of that entry we would create a provision which is a liability so a provision so to increase to increase look at it to increase the liability with credit and you realize that at this point uh, at this point uh, at this point because it was a reduction in asset you know cash is an asset so the reduction is credit here we have reduced it and that is credit and here because we are recognizing an asset we have acquired an asset it's an increase in asset and that is a debit so the last part is that because it is a provision we would have to create a provision for the dismantling provision for the dismantling cost and that would be 111.57 million 11.57 million so uh, this is the initial measurement a very good example to explore and i hope this helps uh, in our preparation. Now, before